All right, so let's dig down and look at, now we're trying to do profiling. Why do we need to do profiling? Well, we have to find out which metals are hot, for example. Or we, need, or we want to do something more complicated, which I'll show a range of examples for profiling. So in our generic sequential analysis, we ran the application. Now we've broken this purple part up into two parts. One is the data collection. Right? Like that says, just counts which methods you're executing, for example. And one is the analysis. And I'm showing data collection is generally less time, hopefully, than the analysis, but it doesn't have to be that way. But I'm showing it that way. All right? So the data collection can only be do, done where it actually happens in the application. Okay? So, so the, by Putting the analysis in line in the application, you make it difficult to optimize the instrumented code, for one, because you're doing kind of this work in line that you don't want to be doing. So, so what most VMs do right now is they trade accuracy for overhead, right? So you only occasionally gather samples, all right, rather than doing it all the time. So I'm going to talk about a generic approach that does that does both, all right? That can handle sampling, not doing sampling or exhaustive, <coughs> exhaustive data collection, all right? And so by reducing the overhead to the application, now we're just going to do some data collection and some enqueuing of the data. So it has to be buffered, and then we're going to do the analysis somewhere else, okay? So now the analysis is all pulled off, and all you're going to do inside the application is the data collection and the queue. All right? How much of the bandwidth do you use for this extra stuff? Because there's an opportunity cost there. That's right. So that's the optimization problem that I'm going to show our solution to. OK? So you can get higher accuracy because you've made, you've taken the analysis out, so you can now instrument more events, but it's now, as David pointed out earlier, with like a write barrier, so if you're keeping track of all the writes, or you're keeping track of all the methods that execute, you now have a little bit of cost everywhere. You have thin purple lines all over the place, all right? And now, in order to make this mechanism work, how much data you're sending, how you're buffering it, that's the key problem for making this work well. All right? So the first side effect to avoid is, let's say the application produces a piece of data. All right? And uh, then the analysis thread tries to use that piece of data really quickly. All right? So if you write it on this cache line and then then the analysis tries to consume it too fast. The application hasn't even finished filling up that cache line, and the analysis is trying to pull it out of the uh, application's cache, and then the application says, oh, no, I need it back because I have to continue filling my buffer, and so that is really bad, okay? So because you have true and false sharing, and the cache line has to move between the two threads that uh, are competing for the cache line, all right? So that's an example of an effect you don't want to have, all right? So, and that's called cache ping pong. All right, so our design is called cache-friendly asymmetric buffering. So people have worked on this problem before and they've used symmetric solutions. But here we want an asymmetric solution because we want to optimize the time in the application and we don't care quite as much about the, the analysis thread because hopefully we're hiding its cost altogether, all right? So we're actively going to avoid the caching penalties, and we're going to make the instrumentation just as light as weight as we can into the, into the application. So we want to enqueue one, one entry at a time, like one method identifier, so we don't want to change in queuing. And then the consumer, though, is instead of consuming one cache line at a time, it's going to consume a bigger chunk at a time. So let's look at this in a little more detail. So, so we're going to let the application fill up, essentially, in this example, two caches worth of buffers. 
the application views the buffer as one giant buffer, okay? The analysis views the buffer in chunks, and it views it in essentially, you can think of them as L1 chunks, all right? But it's not gonna start operating on this chunk until it believes the application's had enough time to not, op to not be using it and for that chunk to fall out of cache. And you could use even better instructions that uh, don't store it in cache if you could collect all the data items before you got them evicted from the cache. So this just works with current hardware. There's some additional hardware support that can make this go even better. So this little smiley face says, the analyzer doesn't do any work until the application's filled up two L1s worth of data, all right? And then it can safely go access this data because it will have fallen out of the L1 of the producer's thread. So let's watch that application writes here. The analyzer is going to read here eventually, but it's going to wait until the application gets to this smiley face until it goes, all right? So if we watch how that happens, it fills up the L1, and now it starts accessing more data. And because it's gone over the L1 quota, these things get evicted in their natural way. Thank you, Steve, for your timing. <laughs> All right? So now you do have some shared ping-ponging of this cache line, which is offering the Sentinel value has the application gotten here yet, all right? So the consumer is polling this cache line for the, for the application to put some data there, okay? So it has it in its cache, and so you have essentially one ping pong of this cache line back and forth as the application starts writing to it and then going back into the application, all right? But that's one line out of two chunks worth rather than every single line, potentially, all right? All right, so now the analysis thread can consume all that and it can wait for the application thread to go get the next chunk of data, all right? So this shows you the how we've made the application code just as tight as we can make it. So it views the buff pointer as one huge buffer, and it just waits until it sees the magic value and then it resets, okay? Whereas the consumer, while the application is running, is basically indexing into this buffer in chunks, all right? So, uh, so we've made the application lighter weight because it's only viewing this as one huge piece of buffer, all right? And then while it hasn't hit the end, it, uh, it, 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 uh, if it has hit the end, it goes back to the beginning. If it hasn't, it checks if, it, uh, if it's caught up to the application. Sorry, <coughs> if the consumer hasn't consumed it yet, all right? All right, so there is a case where they run into each other and it does have to block, all right? But generally, the, the data is empty and that we're using z zero as our sentinel that the, that the application can write into it, all right? Any questions? All right, and so this is the fast path and that's what you see most of the time. And in, if you're using sampling, for example, you don't necessarily have to make the producer block, right? You don't want the producer to block because it's the application, so you can just let the application write over the data if you want, all right? But you still want to keep the consumer two cash line worth of data away, all right? So the framework is providing this asymmetric buffering and it's minimizing the architectural side effects by the mechanism we use. And it's configurable in terms of what the sizes of the buffer, the big buffer are and the little ones. And it, uh, it's optimized for doing every single event, but you can also do sampling in a variety of different ways, one of which I just described, all right? All right, so we, we got so lucky 
that uh, we were implementing it in Jikes RVM when we had a green thread model, which was managing the hardware context explicitly. And, and so this design is scalable inside our framework. And in the meantime, Phil back there was rewriting the thread threads and making them more uh, uh, to run better and to run with modern operating systems by using the p-threads. So we also got to do the native threading model. And this solution doesn't scale perfectly for the native threading model, but that is too much detail for today. But the memory, sca memory scales, the memory usage scales, with the number of threads and the results I'm going to show you. And in practice, it scaled fairly well with the native threading model, but, in th but, but, uh, but it has terrible, some terrible corner cases that you'd have to fix if you're going to use this in a production system. All right? So we evaluated on three different uh, chip multiprocessor <coughs> systems. The Pentium 4 with hyperthreading. So there are two hardware contexts, one logical core. They're shared with hyperthreading, and they have the shared L1 and L2. This is a core 2 quad. Each one has its private L1, two share an L2, and, and there's no shared cache between all four of the threads. And here we have a shared cache across the core i7, which uses hyperthreading. All right? So here, and then uh, we, we use this for a range of different kind of events that you collect in the virtual machine. Method counting, which is just the cheapest, cheapest kind of data that you might ever get to something really expensive, we use cache simulation. So I'm going to show you uh, the call graph data as an example of, of uh, something still pretty lightweight and show you that we have performance advantages when it's even that light of a weight of an analysis. All right? And then we have lots of benchmarks and a, conf a default configuration. So this shows the Pentium 4, uh, and the purple bar is how long uh, it takes to execute all these applications on this hardware with the sequential profiling as it originally existed. So these analysis is in line with the uh, with, uh, application threads. And then this is the core two and this is the core seven. So moving this way for, for faster processors, all right? So this is the instrumentation overhead. So here for what we do for bar one is we just stick in the stick in the element and we overwrite the same element multiple times, okay? So you have each cache graph, in the call graph, we're writing each edge and we're just writing it on top of the last one, all right? So there's no memory effects at all from doing that. That's just the slowdown to the application by observing all the call graph edges as you insert them, all right? So that's really cheap, two, one, two to one percent overhead. Okay, now if you just simply uh, enqueue this data in any buffer, you have some overhead. All right, nobody consumes the buffer at all, but you're just putting it in there. All right, and then if you dequeue it on the other side, that's the cost of the memory system communication. All right, and then if you actually perform it concurrently, you have a little more overhead, but you still get a win on all these, uh, all these compared to the sequ sequentially keeping track of this data. 